Welcome to the review of War of the Lance. War of the Lance was developed and distributed by Strategic Simulations, which is SSI, in 1990. I'm going to be reviewing the PC version of the game. War of the Lance is a strategy game. It is not a role-playing game like the other well-known SSI Gold Box series. But this is Dungeons & Dragons. In fact, it's the Dragonlance world. The objective is to either win as the evil forces or the good forces. It's a single player or dual player game. You can either play against the computer or two people can play against each other. The evil team in this game is the High Lord and the good team is called Whitestone. When you start a new game you only have a few options to choose from. There's first of all scenario or campaign, which I'll talk about later, but then you can set the various levels of difficulty or strength of the various options or players. Level of play, alliance level both affect both players. Options D and E affect the strength of the High Lord or Whitestone player based on the number 1 through 5. 1 means weaker, 5 means stronger. So that will impact battle for the players independently. And then F and G impact how many replacements each player gets during the replacements phase, which I'll talk about later. I'll warn you up front, there's a lot of things in this game that are very cryptic. Even the user manual is not very helpful. Without the user manual, it was almost impossible for me to figure out what was going on. Even after reading the user manual three or four times all the way through, I still didn't really understand what certain things would do. I had to actually just jump in and play it. Incidentally, the game does have the ability to use a joystick, but I used the keyboard. So we press space to begin the game. So the first phase, if you can call it a phase, is the message area where it displays things like what nations were conquered in the previous turn, how the quests are going, different status updates and things that will impact your troops, and any magic treasures found. Some of the events that occur are random, but others seem to be set based on what year and month you are in the game. So the next phase that appears after the messages are the quest phase, and this makes this game quite unique. Basically each player gets a chance to try to find magic artifacts that can be beneficial to the game for them. And the first, depending on who has initiative, might be the High Lord who does their quest and the second would then be Whitestone. So the strange aspect of this game is it does take place in the Dragonlance world and you do have these various heroes, I'll call them, that are in the game. These heroes have a rating. The higher the number, the more likely they are to be able to escape when they get captured, to actually avoid captures, and to find special items. So it's pretty cool that they've included Dragonlance characters into the game. It's not really a role-playing game, but it does give it a little bit of a role-playing feel. So sometimes if you get captured and you try to escape, it can either fail or you can actually get killed. Here we have Tannis, one of the very famous Dragonlance characters, got killed. You can also attempt to rescue other characters that got captured. And once again, sometimes they can get killed. You can rest party if there's any injuries, which will help to heal them and allow them to continue on their quest. There's a status update that does show the status of the party members so that you can tell if they're on the quest or not. So once that phase is complete, it then flips to what's called the reinforcement phase. And this is where you get units for your actual armies or battles. For Whitestone, the good player, they always seem to go up as the game continues. They just get higher and higher over time. Sometimes you'll receive special items in this phase such as armor or these special medallions. And the evil players can too. For example, these minotaurs getting banners, which help their morale and ability to fight. 
Here we've received something called an orb, which I'll talk about later. After this reinforcement phase, it's then to the subversion phase. This is where you can add some units that are on the battlefield to help interfere against the other player's quests. So you don't use actual characters, you use some just generic unit types. So it allows you to explore the map so that you can select the various icons and then be able to choose the troops you want to use. So here you can see we're navigating around with a cursor. But it also helps you to be able to see the different terrain and areas on the map. The map scrolls once you get too far to the side, but it is quite limited with the area of the map. Once you choose the icon that has units, then use the get command and choose which type of unit you want to go on the subversion. Exploring the map like this also helps you prepare for the next phase. Here we can take a look at the different things, like here's a wizard, and it tells you if they're in a fortified city, how much fatigue they have, if they have any items, the unit's quality, etc. If there's multiple units in the same icon, it'll give you options on which one to check. And then once you pick it, you can add it to the subversion phase. It doesn't matter where on the map the units are. They can be way off in the middle of nowhere and you can still add them to subversion and they will still impact the quests. Once you're done with the subversion phase, you can always remove those units later. But you can't remove them and place them anywhere. You have to actually put them back in the same area where you obtained them. Next is the diplomacy phase. This is one of the more cryptic areas of the game. So basically it shows you all the neutral countries that you can possibly ally with. So part one of this phase is the ally phase. The AG column next to a given country determines which player they're supporting the most. Lower numbers are more for Whitestone, higher for the High Lord. The second column is the alliance level. If it's L, it means low, M is medium, and H is high. That determines the strength they have with the given nation. Finally, there's a DR column, which is the number of diplomat points you have invested in that country. The higher the diplomat count there, the more likely it is you can ally with them. And of course, the AG column has a huge impact on that as well. So after you do try to ally, you only get one chance per turn. Then it flips you to the diplomat section of this phase, where you can assign as many diplomats as you want until the column reaches a total of 25. You can't exceed that. Remember that AG column greatly impacts the chance of you being able to ally with them. If you're Whitestone, you want lower numbers, and if you're High Lord, you want higher numbers. You can always bring back diplomats to other countries at the next turn. If you do successfully ally with a neutral nation, it does two things for you. One, it allows you to deploy their troops, and two, it allows you to move inside their area. So you'll immediately be able to deploy the troops during the end of this phase if you ally with them. Now you can only deploy them within their own land and then later on during the movement phase you can move them. After deploying any new units you're presented with a country status view showing which countries have allied with whom. Next is the victory phase. It shows your current score and it shows how many troops were lost, how many you have available, etc. Basically shows who's winning the game. So going back to the country status, basically whoever has the most countries allied with them is most likely to win the game. The VP column is the victory points you get for killing one of those unit types. As you can see, dragons, citadels, wizards are worth a ton of points. 
But this game is extremely hard, let me tell you. I had a very difficult time even getting a draw in the game. You will almost always lose if you're trying to do it based just on score. But the next phase to talk about is called the initiative phase. After that, it determines who's going to be going next, and it follows all the phases for them automatically if it's a computer-controlled player. Here we can see the High Lord as a computer player just going crazy, which is one of the frustrating things in the game. It's like playing chess against a computer. You have to put forth all this effort, and the computer knows exactly what to do, and it does it right in front of you. So in this case, it's Whitestone's initiative. So then you get to do all your turns. The computer randomly determines who has initiative, supposedly, but I haven't been able to figure out a pattern or any factors that influence that. Whoever does have initiative also gets a 25% bonus on all their operation points for their units. The operation points essentially means how many things a given unit can do during that turn, whether it's move, attack, etc. I have noticed the AI of the computer is quite bizarre. Sometimes it'll move units way out of the way when it doesn't need to, and it keeps repeating this pattern over and over until it finally has all the troops deployed in the same manner. So the movement phase is where you get to choose the various units on the map that you have control over and move them within areas that you have the ability to move to. And once again, Alliance determines this. There's a special option called Recon that you can perform on any unit on the map, whether it's yours or the computer. Or I guess if you're playing two humans, the other human player. So if it's your troops, you get to see exactly what's there in the correct counts. If it's the enemy, each time you do recon, it'll show some different numbers. If you do it enough times and then get an average, you'll probably be pretty close to what the reality is. Sometimes there's multiple units stacked within one icon. As I mentioned earlier, having alliances is critical in this game. Because without it, you cannot move your troops through that area. There are some unit types that can go all the way around and have a lot of movement points. But sometimes it's much better just to go directly, especially for troops. You'll see several columns here. Quality is basically the level or strength and attacking power of those troops. Fatigue is how much loss of combat strength they'll have. And OP stands for Operation Points, which I mentioned earlier. Remember those messages I showed at the beginning of the game, the random events? Sometimes that will impact your Operation Points. Sometimes it's for both players, or sometimes it's just for one player. So that helps with the strategy when you're playing the game. There is a special Abort command that you can do as you're moving a troop, where you can either go back one square or all the way back. It's basically an undo. There's one special unit type in the game that has unlimited movement, and that's the wizard. Wizards still cannot cross neutral areas, but you can usually make yourself go all the way around. They can even fly over water, but they have to end on a land tile. Wizards will also greatly impact the efficiency of any other units in the same square during a battle. But there are many other rules that apply to movement. For example, you can't stack with enemy troops. Normal movement costs one operation point, but moving through forest is two, except for elves and kinder. Moving from one ZOC, which is a zone of control, for example, you have a zone of control and the enemy has a zone of control, moving from one of those to another requires three operation points. The only ground units that can go through mountains are wizards, dwarfs, and ogres. No ground units can enter a sea, coast, or river, or even swamp, except the wizards of course, without going into a fleet, which is a special kind of boat or transportation. And air units can fly across mountains or water, 
but they must land on land. There is an auto move command which is very helpful if there's multiple units inside the same icon. As long as the first unit moves somewhere you can say auto move and then all the following units in that same icon will move as well. There's an area where you can view quadrants and then jump directly to that quadrant section of the map. I didn't find that very useful but there it is. More useful you can jump to a higher level view on the map and view pretty much the whole area. Here's a paper version of this exact same map that used to come with the game. So as you can see the land is called Ancelon. One final thing to mention is there's something called a maelstrom and if a fleet runs into it, it immediately stops that turn. Anything entering the maelstrom is randomly teleported to a different location or possibly destroyed. So I don't see much benefit in sending fleets that direction unless you're trying to get away from the enemy. You do have the ability to zoom out on the map so you can see most of it all at once. But once you're done moving, next you can begin your attack sequences. So the way it works is you click on attack and then you say either target or target all. You must be adjacent to the enemy in order to target them. A target means the selected individual unit will attack, whereas target all means all the units in that stack will attack. This is another time where the game is quite cryptic. You have to use the get command before being able to attack. You'd think they would have chosen a word like select, but nope, it's get. But once you get used to that terminology, then it's not that bad. After you do the get on an individual unit, you can see information about them, such as the quality, fatigue, OP, and if they're in a fort, what the strength level of that is. It also shows you what item that it has. Here, for example, this unit has armor. There's also a next command to cycle through units. You can also transfer items using the item command, and it'll allow you to select any other unit within the same icon. Now there's a special unit type in this game that's extremely powerful, and it's called the wizard. The wizard has the ability to move unlimited spaces, and so it's perfect for carrying those items to other units on the map. As I mentioned earlier, wizards can even fly across mountains and water. Another unit type is kind of like a container or a shipping type. There's one called a fleet that allows you to load and unload units. It also has the ability to patrol, which will look for other ships within about a four square radius. To load the units, simply use the load command and then it'll cycle through the units on that same tile. There is a limit to the number you can load. The advantage to fleets is they can move extremely far. They have 50 OP. The disadvantage is they can only move on water or they can go to a city port and unload troops there. Interestingly enough, they can be fought just like other normal unit types. There's also Griffins and Pegasus who can also load and carry some units, although not nearly as many. But the advantage is they can actually fly. So as long as you carry the troops to some land, on the final move you can unload them there. It's probably also time to mention that both players, the Whitestone side and the High Lord side, can generally get any kind of troop type. Now as Griffins or Pegasus move, and if they're carrying units, it'll use up two OP instead of one because of the extra load. So once you arrive to the destination, they can unload the troops anywhere. As long as it's on a tile, those troops could normally stand. Fleets, Griffins, and Pegasus cannot transfer items. Once you're done moving and choosing what targets you're going to attack, then you go to the menu option and choose combat. The game then starts the combat phase and first is what's called naval combat. So all the different fleets will go through their battles if they existed first. 
And you can continue battles or withdraw a lot of times for the naval fights. And the game just keeps updating how many units each player has lost. Then you're presented with a summary of the damage done for that battle. If fleets are by the land, they can actually be attacked by land units. There are three ways in which an individual naval battle will end. Either one player loses all their troops in that fleet, one player chooses to withdraw and gets away, or fog can roll in. So that seems to be something that happens quite frequently. You'll be in the middle of a battle, and then all of a sudden, fog rolls in, battle's over. If you do choose to withdraw, or the enemy chooses to withdraw, the other player can actually pursue them and try to do some extra damage and get extra attacks in. Usually you can completely wipe out the enemy when they do this. The game designers have put in a lot of real-world military components into the strategy of the game. Now the game doesn't tell you when it's done with naval combat. Sometimes you're doing land combat. So if you're the one receiving the attack, you can retreat, stand, or counterattack. And then the game will display the losses that way. Stand gives the defender a lot more defense if they're in a fortress or some other defensive structure. Retreat moves you back a tile and you can take heavy losses. In counterattack, you can also take heavy losses, but there's a chance that you can do massive amounts of damage on the initial attack as well. So the left side shows the High Lord units and how many are involved in the battle, and the right side shows the Whitestone units. So it helps you to figure out whether or not you want to retreat, stand, or counterattack. After a given battle is done, the game just moves on to the next battle, and it cycles through them all until the combat phase is over. You do have the ability to display the battle, which is very interesting. So the game generates a backdrop of the terrain that you're on, and then it shows little icons of the various unit types. And then they either move from right to left or left to right, depending on who's doing the attacking and what type of attack mode they have. The computer completely controls this process, and really it's just for visual representation. It does not impact the actual combat results. Sometimes you'll see a phrase that says unit eliminated, which means there's no more numbers in that given unit and then you're presented with the elim status you can retreat as I mentioned earlier which simply means you're going to give up that position on the map and sometimes take very heavy losses doing so you can even be pushed back at times with regular fights if you lose the battle even when doing a stand As I mentioned earlier, you can be the one that is either defending or attacking. If you're attacking, you can either retreat, do a light attack, or a heavy attack. The heavy means both sides will receive heavier losses. And of course, light is the converse of that. Now the game does allow you to use terrain to your advantage. However, sometimes you think you're protected and you're really not. Here I thought I had this area blocked off pretty well, and then I forgot that there were dragons. And dragons could fly right over the mountains and attack me. If you're fighting in some kind of fort, you'll see the fort column there has a value. The lower the number, the weaker the fort, and the less protection. Some troop types will actually build forts in the tiles they're on as they just wait there. The computer has a real knack on how to get to you without suffering the consequences of the terrain advantage. For example, here they're moving their fleets all the way around so they can come up from behind. And once again, if you're the attacker and you choose to attack the enemy, whether light or heavy, you have the option whether you want to try to advance or not. 
If you try to advance, you're going to try to encroach on their tile and push them back. And of course, it depends on if you're winning the fight or not. It is a really nice touch how you can zoom in on the battles and see how they're going. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the War in Middle Earth game, which actually came out two years before this game. Plus, it allowed you to actually control individual units or characters in battle. And you've probably noticed by now, the game has no sound. The graphics, of course, are EGA, which was starting to fall behind quite a bit by 1990. But having no sound is a pretty big impact. The battle scenes are really cool, though, showing the various terrain types depending on where your units are based. Here, for example, we had some dwarves hiding out in a fortress in the mountains. And the graphics represent that. Or here some ogres were attacking our elves in a fortress. It is very strange how the icons either move right to left and sometimes you're like, what in the world are they doing? It just always seems to move left no matter what's happening, like these dragons in the upper left corner. And then sometimes you'll see a message that says unit routed. I'm assuming that means the unit was driven from the battlefield, but the manual says nothing about this. There are unit types called leaders, which improve the quality and the battle capability of your other troops. They can't do too much damage on their own. In fact, they can't actively attack themselves. But if they are attacked, I have seen them kill a unit or two during a retreat. But once again, you use them to transfer items around and to give boost to the other units in the same stack. Another special type of attack is one from dragons. Dragons have the ability to do what's called dragon fear. You don't have to do the dragon fear attack. You can just do a normal attack, in which case the dragon has a higher chance of being killed during battle. If you use just Dragon Fear, then they fly over the battlefield, greatly decreasing the chance of them being attacked. And it causes the enemy to kind of be crippled, where they don't fight as well, and it reduces the quality of the fight for them. But even if you don't choose to use the Dragon Fear attack directly, all enemies still receive Dragon Fear. So basically, it's just whether or not you want your dragons to try to participate in the battle and do some extra damage, or you just want them to cripple the enemy units so that your other units in the same stack can do more damage. There's many different dragon types in the game, but they're all equal. It doesn't impact combat at all. Dragons and wizards are definitely the most powerful unit types in the game. In fact, if you're fighting against dragons and you don't have any yourself, chances are they're not going to lose any, and you're going to lose a lot of troops. The game does try to stick to some of the Dragonlance storyline. In fact, it talks about some of the various characters, as I mentioned earlier, like Raceland and him finding a dragon orb. The dragon orbs in this game are extremely powerful. They allow you to push back some of the dragons during battles. Without them, you're pretty much toast. The orbs do have to be present with a given unit during a battle, otherwise it won't be used. Here we can see dragons being turned away by the orb. But the High Lord or the computer player can also get orbs. So if you have good dragons on your side, you may be pushed away. And then finally, you'll start to find dragon lances, or more appropriately, you'll forge them. Dragon lances allow you to actually kill the dragons instead of just turning them away. Greatly increases your efficiency against them. You can kill dragons without the dragon lance, but it's extremely difficult.
The wizard is similar to the leader, in which they can't attack directly themselves, but they can be attacked. They are pretty slippery though, it's pretty difficult for enemies to be able to kill wizards. But once again, you wouldn't normally use wizards that way. You would stack them with other units to give the bonus during combat to the other units. But the biggest benefit of the wizard is being able to move unlimited distance. So right before a battle, during the movement phase, you can move them all the way around the map and join up with your set of units that are going to be in a battle. Also, you can use them to transfer the items, which is priceless. Another thing that can improve your side of the battles is if you find gnome technology. If the gnome technology works during a battle, it improves the quality of your troops. And essentially you'll do close to double damage. If it fails, however, it'll be the opposite effect. Your unit troops will lose quality. So from that perspective, it's a bit of a gamble. Since it is an item, you could always transfer it away. You can also lose combat strength for a given battle if you become completely surrounded. And then finally, as battles go on, unit quality can actually increase. I kind of equate it to leveling up. So the more combat experience a given unit has, the higher its quality will go. Of course, fatigue does impact quality. As your fatigue goes up, your ability to fight goes down. So after combat, it finally enters the next phase which is essentially wrapping all the way around to phase one with the messages. So it explains what happened the previous year, and then you get status updates. Here, for example, the Dark Queen army offensive has slowed, or Undead has now joined the High Lord, which is bad news for you as a good player. Here the Minotaurs have sided with the bad player, as I said earlier, some of these messages are actually not random. They're portrayed later in the game, trying to stick more toward the story, I believe. Here they ended up getting a wizard, which is bad news. But here we got our own wizard. Good news. And eventually, late in the story, you'll start getting some dragons, which are fantastic, and they can finally help you to start winning some of these battles because up until now you lose most of them. Here we get a diplomat bonus this turn. And here Whitestone actually gets a fatigue advantage and can recover some of it. You get fatigue by the way for moving and attacking. Here you can see the fatigue will go up. We got a fatigue of four now. There's a funny story about the Kenders, who which incidentally is one special unit type in the game, who has a taunt attack which can separate some of the enemies. Eventually you'll start seeing some of your castles fall, and time starts to run out. You have six game years if you play in campaign mode, so that's basically 30 full turns. If time runs out, you're presented with a score for either win, lose, or draw and it's based on your score. Here you can see an anticlimactic ending where it just says High Lord is victorious. And in this case we had a stalemate which was the best I was ever able to do with the score component and it was a draw. Now the Whitestone player can win if they capture Naraka which is the tower to the northwest. Or the High Lord player can win if they can conquer the four knight countries, plus the Claris Tower near Palanthus. That's the only realistic way to win this game, in my opinion. Now, earlier I talked about scenario versus campaign. 
The campaign starts one year earlier, and the scenario starts obviously after that, and you're already set up for a battle in which you're going to lose. I guess the scenario is to kind of get your feet wet with the game and introduce it to you. Now you can save the game, but the game mechanism is very strange. You type in a letter in which you want to save, A through Z, and then the game automatically tacks on the month or period and the year. What makes this very difficult is then when you go to restore the game, you have to know which of those to type in. And you only type in the first seven letters. What makes this worse is it's not sorted properly because it doesn't put the year first. It puts the letter first and then the period, which might be SEP for September. And then it makes it even worse because there's actually something called winter. So it'll have W-I-N in the file name. One final thing to mention the High Lord can actually create what's called a citadel. In fact, he can get multiples of them. And they're similar to the Griffins, Fleets, and Pegasi, where they can load units and then fly through the air. Citadels can carry three large combat units, plus leaders and wizards, for a total of ten units. So they're extremely dangerous. Luckily, the High Lord only gets them late in the game. So in closing, what did I think about War of the Lance? Well, it was really a mixed bag for me. It was quite revolutionary with some of the ideas, and I can't recall a game that is very similar with all these different phases in a strategy game. It's also very cool that it was Dungeons and & Dragons and takes place in the Dragonlance world. It's a nice touch how they had display graphics for combat, as an option, although it is kind of goofy with the movements and things of that nature. There's a creepy looking mannequin looking armor here, which you've probably noticed was actually used in a different game. It started in Curse of the Azure Bonds and then was later revamped for Secret of the Silver Blades, as you can see there. But look at that weird mannequin head that they put in there. That's just creepy. It's interesting how you can get different items and move them around to your troops, giving a very slight RPG feel to the game, and how you can increase quality of units. I think if the game had more instructions and it wasn't so cryptic, it would have been more fun to play, especially for people back then when they got the game. And also the difficulty level was a little bit too high, even when you make the High Lord weak. It's just through the roof. But overall, it's a good game and presents quite a few different game qualities I haven't seen before. So if that sounds interesting to you, then I recommend the game. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.